future of the struggling restaurant and food industry with Justin Marks, CEO of Marks Foods. Hello, Justin. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Give me, a, give me a quick description, would you please, of Marks Foods? So Marks Foods is the e-commerce part of uh, Marks Company. So we, we sell to uh, restaurants, retailers, consumers, and distributors nationwide through three divisions. Mm-hmm. Been a rough year for your customers, I assume? Some. Some. It's definitely a mixed bag, like everything else that we've heard and seen in the media. Some, some companies are doing really well and some are suffering, but mm-hmm. the majority of our restaurant customers are suffering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Although I guess where the food is going, uh, it, does that change too? I mean, the, does the nature of the customer base change? Because we know that grocery stores and the like are, are doing quite well, whereas sit-down restaurants are not. Or do you keep the same customer base even in a situation like this? Well, we'll find out as restaurants come back whether we have the same customer base. We mm-hmm. know that a lot of them have closed permanently, but some of them have actually just started reaching out to us again in the past few weeks. So some of them have been very quiet. But one aspect of our supply chain is that demand, aggregate demand has been relatively steady. Business has mm-hmm. been off for sure for the year, but it's demand has actually bounced among channels kind of yeah. in a very volatile fashion. Over well, the that's last a good year. sign. I want to get a sense though of who's going to succeed in the food service industry even after COVID-19 and who isn't and what distinguishes the successors from the others. Give me a sense of what it takes to survive right now and going forward in the future. I think it depends on the type of establishment. The larger establishments that are really well capitalized, I think, have been able to kind of sit in and, and, and weather it. It's the independent ones, the mom and pop restaurants, the single units or, or a few unit chains that have, that have really struggled. And there's been, it's, it's really just been a question of, of how resilient and tough and, and unwilling to quit they've been. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been through a lot. They've, uh, they've had more struggles than just COVID. So, for example, when that big snowstorm hit New York City, uh, for example, they had to shut down a lot of their outdoor dining operations that they had spent a lot of money into, and in a lot of cases took on a lot of damage. There's been a lot of instances like that where they can't, where they just haven't been able to catch a break this year. Mm-hmm. One other example was here in Seattle, where where we've got some restaurant distribution. They had just opened up. The governor had just allowed them to open up for Valentine's Day, and then we got a nasty snowstorm that came through. Unexpectedly. Yeah. Yeah. So Texas they, they, too, they same yeah. same thing down there. I'd imagine uh, you think everything's ready to go, and then all of a sudden, it's just a few days later, it's not. So, uh, yeah. outdoor dining, I guess, is is one way to help save them, but it can't possibly make up for the lack of revenue that that you get from indoor. Correct. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. Mm-hmm. It it helps, and I think it's helped a lot of these guys survive. And and I think that what's going to happen is the ones that have been really scrappy, and the ones that have really fought and have never quit are going to emerge the strongest. Yeah. I want to talk though about some aspects that are going to be important going forward. And that is sourcing standards, supply chain control, how they might be the key ongoing for stable food production amid crises of this kind. Um, What are we talking about when we're talking about sourcing standards and how might those be brought to bear in a way that can help these companies to survive? Well, I think that restaurants are going to be forced to focus even more on profit profitability than before. And that may sound unusual to anybody in business, but it's important to understand that restaurants are, it's also an art. I mean, a lot of chefs are artists and a lot of restaurants were started by by people with a dream to hang up a shingle. They may not have necessarily had a business education and they kind of just found their way through it. There's of course a huge spectrum of of customers out there, but I think that for the for the independent restaurants, they're going to, they're going to really have to focus their sourcing on products that they can they can make money on. There's just going to be a heightened concentration on profitability. There just has to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, almost the cliche of restaurant operations is that they make all their money at the bar. <laughs> that may be over overstating it to some degree, but it certainly is an aspect of it, is it not? It's not even the food that makes the money, right? It's it's the whole, I think that they need the whole mix. You know, mm-hmm. you hear that that a lot of the profitability is in is in on the bar side, but profitability on the menu is essential as well. Yeah. Do you see changes in sourcing patterns? I mean, for many, many years now, it's been a big distinction for restaurants that get that source locally. Uh, But I'm wondering if that's even more of a concern now because longer supply lines lead to longer complexities and more uncertainties about about reliability of supply. Is localization continuing as a trend or not? 
Yeah, localization is definitely continuing, but I think the pandemic is forcing people to look at, from a more uh, broad perspective, what is not just the most profitable, but what's also the most sustainable. And in some cases, like for example, our grass-fed beef from New Zealand, uh, it's a very complex equation. However, product produced on pasture, even far away, can be more sustainable than stuff that's produced locally in a feedlot. And there is, there has always been a very big bias among restaurants to buy their product from local feedlots rather than sourcing them from the most sustainable, most humane programs. Um, so there is always, with crises like this, there's opportunities to introduce new products and restaurants right now are really interested in looking at other things. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. But nonetheless, apart from the local question, I think that the sustainability question is gonna, the profitability question I think is gonna be paramount. Um, and if you take, for example, uh, our, our ribeyes, for example, have 32% better yields on them because there's less fat. There's nothing you have to trim away. And those are the types of products that I think are going to be real winners going forward. I take it sustainability is a big deal for you, that your own product line uh, puts a big emphasis on that, correct? It does. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And, 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 us, and do, you, do you source internationally as well as domestically yourself? I mean, how much yes, of that do. comes from various places percentage wise, can you even say? Uh, the majority of our products are actually imported, and mm -hmm. it's been our focus for the last decade to find the most humane, most sustainable products in the world, regardless of where they are. Um, and so the majority right now of our products come in from New Zealand, for example, where they've got a, a centuries long experience raising animals on pasture, and they know how to do that properly. Mm -hmm. Have you had reliability of supply of international stuff? Because, of course, we hear these reports of terrible congestion at the ports of L.A. and Long Beach and other places with severe slowdowns in the processing of containers co coming in, coming into the country. Has that affected you? We've been mildly affected by that. Uh, not to the extent that you hear about in the news, because since we're handling the premium programs for our suppliers, they're making sure that our shipments get prioritized. And, oh. of course, we've got just excellent communication with our suppliers and we've been we've been expecting this um, our our vendor silver fern farms in new zealand for example has really given us good heads up so we've been able to plan very well for this yeah i've spoken to silver fern farms by the way oh, cool. and it sounds like things are going quite well with them uh, which is quite surprising i guess given the larger picture there you are in seattle by the way seattle tacoma has been uh, said to be a good alternative port gateway uh, for bringing stuff in uh, as opposed to la long beach are you doing any, any consideration of that no, we're not. At the moment, most of our product is coming in through the East Coast, through the Port of Philadelphia. Oh, East Coast. Okay. So yeah. you don't even have to deal with the West Coast. Yeah. Okay. Well, and that's, 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 that's helped good well. for you. Uh, to get back to restaurants and menu changes and things like that, sustainability, better yield, uh, comfort foods, um, you know, less meat. You know, do, I mean, do we see a general, uh, you know, a general trend that you know, restaurants in general or, or not? 100% in terms of comfort foods. There's mm -hmm. they're almost almost immediately. It, it happens that comfort foods generally are better takeout meals anyway. So it worked that way, but there was a shift. There was definitely a, a, the uh, um, downgrading in terms of the, the proteins that were used. So instead of going for uber premium cuts, like, uh, like a tenderloin, for example, restaurants may have shifted to flat iron steaks or instead of a rack, a lamb rack, they would go, they would go for a chump. There was definitely mm -hmm. a downgrade in terms of the the price of products. So restaurants are generally using cheaper products and, and there also has been a significant shift to comfort foods. And I think that these things will continue on into the future as well. People get and, used to it. They're not necessarily going to go back to their old habits very quickly. Yeah. And I think that I restaurants think. are going to also keep themselves set up to serve these kind of omni channels. So not mm -hmm. just thinking about themselves anymore as just an a in, indoor dining restaurant, but they're going to be forced to think about themselves at outdoor dining as well and, and takeout. And takeout too. I mean, takeout, of course, has always been something, part of their operation, but I'm wondering as more and more diners, quote unquote, uh, get used to the takeout option, whether they'll have to continue to sustain that as a major part of their business. I think that they will. I'm, I'm certainly expecting that they will. And currently, if you go into a lot of restaurants and, and you can, but if you actually go in there, you'll see that their dining rooms have been, been taken over by takeout containers and, yeah. and other packaging materials. And I think that they're going to have to plan for that when, and it's going to change the types of locations that they look for. Uh, and it's going to change everything. But boy, does that eat away at their profit margin using the delivery services to take a big hunk of that for themselves. Uh, is that a sustainable model going forward? You know what? I'm not sure, but I'll tell you this, these guys cannot catch a break. So <laughs> no, uh, I'm, sure. I'm, 
I'm sure that they, you know the ones that are still standing are are smart. They've they figured out how to get their costs under control, and so I, I have confidence that that for the ones that are doing it still, it, it does make sense. Do you think that the growth of meal kit delivery services is going to have a, a long term impact on restaurants? I don't. Uh, I've been watching the meal kits pretty closely from from the beginning, and I haven't. Mm-hmm. I haven't, haven't really seen any impact yet. And I don't think that we're going to see any impact going forward. The meal kits are, are definitely good for people that, um, that need some help in the kitchen. Um, and, but I don't think it's a, repl- it's a replacement for a restaurant meal. It's a replacement for what they would otherwise be doing at home. It's not yeah. like instead of going to this restaurant, we're going to bring in these meal kits or anything like that. Yeah, I think so. So your view of the future, it sounds like you're pretty optimistic that we're going to get back to uh, get back on our feet in an, in an industry that is already very challenged, very low mar- profit margins, but you're confident we're go- going in a good direction? I am optimistic, and I have not been optimistic very much over the last year. Mm-hmm. There would not have been many moments you would catch me, but I think that with the vaccination rate going up, with the, outdoor, with the weather getting nicer and the potential for outdoor dining, and, uh, and hopefully with a little bit more stimulus. I noted in the House stimulus bill, that, which is still very much an early draft, they've got some pretty generous provisions for restaurants. I think my expectation is that going forward, things coming together, that restaurants are gonna really gonna pop in the next few months. Good news. Justin Marks of Marks Foods, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for your time, really appreciate it. Thank you very much.